Hey there, this is Jenny Chen. I'm the founder of 3D Heels. Welcome to the latest podcast, the official podcast for 3D Heels. This is where you will find fun but in depth conversations with technological game changers, creative minds, entrepreneurs, rule breakers, and more. Focusing on how we can use 3D technologies like 3D printing and bioprinting to reinvent healthcare and even life sciences. This podcast will also include AMA or Ask Me Anything sessions, past Instagram live interviews with influencers, and other direct engagements with our tribe. All right, so we're here. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Welcome and thanks for joining us. And thank you for joining us, Stephanie. I want to give a little bit brief introduction of Professor Stephanie Willers. Uh, you're actually an active, acting chair for the biomedical research and biomedical engineering programs at University of Victoria. Um, I also want to say that you're one of the youngest chair of such title. Um, so congratulations. Um, I looked into your bio uh, a little bit, and it sounds like you're, you're, you're not really Canadian. Uh, you moved <laughs> across, basically, from the eastern border of the U.S., slowly migrating towards the West Coast, and eventually you ended up in uh, Victoria. So congratulations, you, ma you made it. <laughs> you know, I got to say, I'm originally from Missouri, so um, I went east, then came back, and then uh, I, I have to point that out because I, I just got an award from my alma mater, Wash U, and uh, they, they're very proud that, like... Uh, right. Good, good, good Missouri girl, doing good um, <laughs> now, in, now in Canada. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So, I mean, this, this kind of interview really is to introduce a rather serious subject like bioprinting, biofabrication to in a very, uh, in a little bit more casual way. But still, we want to talk about science. Um, so the number one topic, I think everybody who's just joined us is what is bioprinting or 3D bioprinting? Oh, yeah, for sure. And I do have like, as, a, as all good professors do, I have all my props here. But you know, everyone's probably on this Instagram is very familiar with all the traditional 3D printing, such as our little 3D printed axolotls, which is our company mascot. Um, and so I think 3D bioprinting really sprung from, from that concept as 3D printing got more popular was when people began to modify. And I know um, Adam Feinberg at Carnegie Mellon, his group does this a lot, was began to modify their 3D bioprinters to not just print, you know, plastics and things, but to actually try and print things like cells. And uh, I think a lot of the original 3D bioprinters were homemade, and you see a lot of like the microfluidic influences there. Um, so it's really sort of tuning these systems to be able to um, print tissues. And so to do that, you need specialized materials, things that are a bit more uh, sensitive to the properties of the cells and just, you know, hard plastics. Um, also, another thing is when you work with living things like cells, you can't just melt things like you do with plastics. So you need to have printing conditions that were gentle enough to keep your cells alive and, as well as survive when you actually printed them into constructs. And so um, I think there's sort of been a couple generations of this. And then if you sort of look at the matrix of bioprinters, you have things that are on the higher end, like the Regin Hughes um, aspect biosystems. Um, those types of printers. And then there's things like the levies. Uh, some of the selling products are pretty affordable. So you sort of got this span of like home brewed tissue printers for research use. And then there's sort of the higher resolution, um, more technical machines where they're looking for clinical applications. So it's been, a, it's been a really exciting time. And it's really been interesting just to see the technology evolve even in the last like half decade. Yeah, what's really interesting is when 3D printing first came out, it didn't really create a machine solely for biology or bioprinting and it really is the researchers themselves created a new tool on top of a new tool to generate this new field um so you mentioned some of the challenges in bioprinting would you like to just break it down to components of what are some of the day-to-day -day challenges you face of each of these components from the cell to bio ink to the machine to the software and maybe even more that i don't know about yeah, yeah, no, I mean, that's one of the things that actually makes 3D printing and 3D bioprinting really cool is you have all these fields coming together. Um, but uh, as, as someone says, you know, like jack of all trades, master of none. Um, so uh, yeah, definitely each uh, different component has its own issues. Um, depending on which bioprinter you use, like a lot of them have their own homemade CAD software. And I know it's driven some of my um, 
computational students a little bit crazy, some of the, the processing that goes on with the G code, which I think some companies do that to try and get proprietary things, um, and some of the limitations for, for making more complex shapes and some of the software issues. Uh, a personal pet peeve of, of mine, and for anyone who's out there working on this, um, it would be great to predict if a uh, bioink cell structure would be printable before you actually have to do it. Uh, we usually have to trial and error, usually with cheaper materials, cheaper inks, um, to see if a structure will print. Mm -hmm. So I know I know that um, Aspect has some uh, AI people working on some of that. Uh, printers themselves, even with traditional 3D printers, getting clogs, um, getting your throughput. Um, especially when you're working with some of the more viscous biomaterials and cells, you can get a lot of clogging and things. And I know my group um, and probably lots of groups around the world have done a lot of troubleshooting on how you actually get your, your systems to flow. And, and they do say uh, when you get some of the printers working really well, you know, you can get up to 100 tissues in a day. So um, that's some of the, the machine challenges, obviously moving parts, lots of maintenance and things like that, um, depending on the sister, system, control of pressure, um, control of fluids, things like that. Um, on the inks, well, that's uh, where our company comes in, but um, there's still a lot of work to be done on the material science side. Um, a lot of the initial bio inks like alginate were selected specifically because they um, are very easy to print and to define structures, but they don't necessarily keep your cells alive or functioning, especially if you work with uh, sensitive cells like stem cells. Um, so that's something that's been um, very big and, and uh, big challenge in the field. And also if you look um, again at, at Adam Feinberg's work, uh, he's you know, with the um, life support system, being able to actually print bigger structures and things like that, enabling tools. And yeah, he also recently mentioned, you know, better materials for printing, printing cells for clinical applications. And actually that's another interesting thing with the inks um, having to do the market analysis on the axolotl side. Uh, so many of the inks are, have animal derived products. So you're not gonna be printing tissues with those that go into people. Um, and I've actually talked about that a lot with some of our collaborators, including Aspect, you know, and, and even with selling, we talk biomaterial sourcing, just getting things to be really consistent in these fields is a, a lot more difficult than, you know, you, you look at traditional 3D printing and you're like, plastics, so easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, well, yeah. before I asked you that question, I had some challenges in mind, but now that you're talking, I'm learning there are more challenges than I knew <laughs> about the animal derived products that that is definitely a challenge. Um, and also just to clarify some of the concepts that we see a lot in the news so that people have a more clear understanding of concepts is the concept of organoid. And also, I, I also want you to also address another concept of the organ on a chip concept, the microfluid that you just mentioned. I think these concepts are kind of mixed up with bioprinting and 3D printing a lot. And I think it would be just helpful to have an actual professor to explain that to us. Definitely. So um, organoids, so, uh, organoids are essentially miniature tissues that are derived from stem cells. And the, the principle of this is we all arose from embryos that contain these stem cells that have instructions on how to make any cell type found in your body. Um, organoids take this idea and essentially use those inherent properties of stem cells to um, generate these miniature tissues. Um, our lab's done them for that you can make these miniature brains and they will have neuronal function and things like that. You also see miniature kidneys. Um, and so it really comes from this intrinsic property of stem cells that you get these, these organoid mini tissues. Um, and so that, that's where that concept comes from. Um, it's been a bit difficult to get these to be super reproducible, though a lot of really great engineering groups are working on it. Um, my friend uh, Ethan Lippman, who's at Vanderbilt, his group has done a lot of really cool work because um, when you make them, you're usually putting them in bioreactors and things like that. And anytime you work with cells, there's inherent variability, but um, lots of cool stuff there. Organ on a chip is, again, you know, and, and some people even say, like, we put organoids on a chip. And mm -hmm. um, really is where you're getting in these microfluidic systems where you're miniaturizing the tissues. So uh, you're, you're usually, um, you know, looking at these devices in the micro scale, and you'll have, you know, some cells present. Uh, the nice thing about being in miniature is you can actually have you know, multiple cell types present, and then you can have sort of a tissue chip that's your liver versus, you know, your kidneys and string them all together, although there are still challenges getting all your things to, to work um, in the same place. And since you uh, did bring up microfluidics, I do have uh, one of the Aspect microfluidic print heads, which I don't know if that'll show up on camera. Uh, have can... to hold it in a certain light, I think. Yeah. Okay, let's see. If it's we... probably difficult. Yeah, it's, it's clear, so it's a bit hard to see, but um, actually I can probably pull it out. Um, 
So you can also take a picture later and then we'll, we'll include yeah. it in our post process video as well. Yeah, so essentially you have these little plastic chips that have different channels and yeah. so you can fill them with cells. In the case of Aspect, they use it to deliver your bioink. Um, and so you can culture them just like you would normal cells, but they're miniature, so you know, saves, saves money because you're using less resources. And then you can, as I said, string together multiple things. So that's sort of your organoids, um, your microfluidics. And there is a whole subset of bioprinting, as you've seen here, where they use these microfluidic printheads to make complex tissue models. Yeah, in that sense. So that's a huge subject. Microfluidic itself is a huge subject, also with a pretty interesting history as well. Um, but going back to these two concepts, so my understanding of organoids is basically a rather disorganized clump of cells that you were able to grow with no, no vasculatures or any other kind of complexities. Is that true? Um, no, you can get like, uh, you can get some, some of the brain organoids can be pretty complex and you can, in some cases, induce vasculature, which is a whole nother uh, <laughs> kettle, of, kettle of fish there. Um, but uh, definitely with some of the brain organoids, you do see the organization. The, the issue comes up with it's, it's not as consistent as people would like. And that's why it's been a bit um, like pharmaceutical companies have been really slow to use them for, for drug screen applications. They, they look when they when they work, they look really cool. Um, you can see some of the different uh, regions of the brain. And it also depends on what factors you treat with. Um, but yeah, um, I haven't done a literature search lately, but um, usually for the brain organoids, it is the lack of vasculature that limits their size mm -hmm. uh, when you're actually making these, these tissues. Although some people have actually made um, multiple different brain organoid regions and then they stick them together, um, which is also kind of interesting. But like the vasculature issue remains challenging, I think both for organoids and bioprinted tissues, as well as also organ on a chip because it's hard to get your blood flow to coordinate with your tissues. Yeah. Trying to model stuff. It would be hard to imagine. I think the limitation of my, uh, the organ on a chip is, is, is limited in size of how much you can grow the cells in three dimension. Is that right? Well, sort of. Cause I mean, if you get over a certain size then you aren't really going to be microfluidic, like you lose all the advantages of being, um, you know, a small microfluidic chip, you know, if you scale up in size. So obviously bioprinting can address some of these challenges. Like maybe it's, maybe it can be more consistent and maybe I have more, um, maybe a, a, a more, I would say, I'm, I'm missing out the word, like a broader ability of creating complex 3D larger structures. Yeah, well, I think like inherently with bioprinting, um, and it you know, goes to printer resolution, but since you are starting with the same file each time, it's, uh, it's a bit more reproducible than uh, some of the organoid methods currently. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other area where I think uh, Jordan Miller and his, his lab at Rice and also Volumetrics have done some really lovely work is with their work making vasculature um, and their printing technologies, where I, I see it all having to sort of connect kind of like his, his technology, sort of the Prelis technologies where you've got, you know, people working really strongly on the vasculature to, you know, keep it intact and then being able to print um, tissue on top of that, which is something we've done in our lab uh, where we've actually printed directly neural progenitors on one of these Pirellis baskets that's mimicking vasculature. So I think we'll, we'll get there eventually, but it, as with all things, it's getting your technologies to integrate. Um, even like with the organ on a chip stuff, you might not think about it, but if you're trying to connect a brain tissue to a heart tissue to a kidney tissue and have it all be on the same circulatory system, um, normally in a dish, you're, you don't have a circulatory system, you have cell culture media. And yeah. Brain tissue, brain tissue media is way different from kidney. And so um, a lot of times with that, the, the biggest challenge in microfluidics is actually getting a media that'll grow both. And that's something that we've also seen a little bit um, when we've been moving into trying to do some vasculature with our brain tissues too. Awesome. I think it will be a miss without saying that most of your research, at least in the past, has been focusing on the brain. And I actually remember how we met, Stephanie. Uh, <laughs> do you remember how we met? We met... Uh, at a conference uh, maybe four or five years ago at uh, one of those University of Victoria bioprinting conference hosted by Aspects. That was yeah. the first time I met you. You're one of the most energetic speakers among all other scientists. And we were both holding a glass of wine and you're telling me that, that you focus your research on the brain. You just published a book actually um, <laughs> on the brain. And I actually, you know, my past, my current history still is neuroradiologist and I did research in GBM and I, I take care of GBM patients on a daily basis almost. Um, 
So I totally understand the devastation of that disease and among other neurological disease. So you want to just tell us a little bit about what kind of research work you do focusing on the brain? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That's that brings back memories. Yeah. The Aspect <laughs> Conference. I can. I'm like on the patio. At UBC. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, and then in the background. Um, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, no, our, our lab and uh, my, my research program has um, always been uh, mainly focused around neural tissue. I started off being very hardcore spinal cord injury, which is quite interesting because in recent years we've moved definitely um, more into brain tissue. And so we've really been looking at ways to bioprint um, patient-derived uh, human-induced pluripotent stem cell lines. So we have some uh, HIPSC lines from our collaborator, Dr. Haka Nygaard, who's over at UBC. Um, and also, I think he would be mad if I didn't mention this, but if anybody out there who does bioprinting with stem cells is looking for a postdoc, <laughs> we are looking for someone to work on these projects I'm about to talk about. Uh, so he runs their Alzheimer's clinic. So he's an MD, PhD. So he sees patients like you do. Um, and they actually, you can actually do a blood draw from the patients, reprogram them back into being stem cells. And we've been able to bioprint them. And my, my student, John uh, Walter Shumka, who's actually defending his thesis this afternoon, um, he actually did bioprint these patient um, Alzheimer's cell lines into tissues. And his, his whole thesis, it's lovely work. We're hoping to submit it later this summer. Um, showed that you know you do see these uh, neuronal deficiencies in the 3d printed tissues compared to when they've been uh, isogenically uh, controls these control cell lines have corrected for the alzheimer's mutation so it's a bit crazy that you can study alzheimer's um, in a dish and now we're studying it as 3d printed tissue we're doing similar work um with a parkinson's line with my uh, graduate student ruchi who i think is actually speaking uh this saturday at um one of the the local groups that is looking into 3d bioprinting as alternative to animal testing and then with glioblastoma we have a collaboration with a company called zonula and we had a really excellent paper come out this past summer where my uh, former student emka uh, printed this co-culture model where we had human glioblastoma alongside healthy neural tissue and we found this drug from the company that would just selectively um, destroy these tumors in the 3D model which um, in terms of 3D printing and you know as a doctor glioblastoma is horrible horrible disease. yes and when you culture these cells in in 2D versus 3D when we culture them in our 3D bioprinted tissues like they are so invasive and it's such a terrible disease but also that's why it's been so hard to, to study is you don't have models that are replicating that those properties when it's a big, tightly, uh, uh, tightly connected tumor. And so it's much easier to kill cancer in 2D than actually in a brain or in a 3D tissue. So I think that that's where you're going to see a lot of, of power in these 3D bioprinting approaches. And I know that um, there's uh, lots of other groups out there that have been looking at all these different cancer models with bioprinting. So. Yeah, I actually remember seeing that paper. I was pretty excited and I sent it to all my neurosurgeons because uh, <laughs> You know, it's, it's such a hopeless thing once you get the diagnosis. Um, but I know we're going to find a solution to this. So guys, just stay tuned for future Stephanie's work on this. Um, so let's pivot a little bit. Now, you're a professor, but how did you decide to start a company, which is Axolotl? First of all, what is Axolotl? I have to look that up. Yeah. It's a small animal, but it's a mammal. It's What is it? The Mexican salamander, so that's, yeah, like my, my <laughs> yeah, so they, um, so Laura, our co-founder, um, she's actually from Mexico, and, and uh, so this was our mascot, because they have a highly regenerative nervous system, so uh, there's a whole field of um, regenerative medicine where they study things like the axolotl, um, that have high regenerative capacity, and they compare it to, you know, so why can their nervous system regenerate, and humans can't, and it's sort of an evolutionary thing, which is, at some point that, you know, the things that make us human, our, our developed brains, our spinal cords, let us do all these, you know, like have conversations like this. Um, it's evolutionarily better if you have a, a brain injury, a spinal cord injury to actually just seal off this, the spared tissue rather than try to regenerate because you can actually have some pretty devastating effects. And I mean, this is, you know, years of, of evolution. Whereas if you're a, an axolotl chilling in Mexico, um, swimming <laughs> around in the lake, or, you know, you're a planaria, it's, a, you know, just regenerate all you want because like what's, you know, it's such a simple organism. So uh, that's, that's where our mascot came from um, is their highly regenerative nervous system. And that makes sense. So, yeah. <laughs> so what is, so what is axolotl biosciences does? Yeah, so we um, specialize in making high quality bioinks to print um, essentially tissues derived from human stem cells. So uh, as I've told you, and, and people have heard this story know, and maybe people here have bothered me about this, um, we've um, 
my research lab focused on making biomaterials that were really good at supporting uh, neural cell growth and differentiation. And we started working with Aspect and we made a printable version. And so then um, a lot of groups reached out and like, can we use your bioink to print like our tissues? So we're sending it to collaborators. Um, and then a lot of other scientists reached out and were like, can we just buy your ink? And so uh, that's when we decided we should incorporate. Also, um, Eric, who's the CEO of Cell Inc., we were talking at the Biomedical Engineering Society meeting. You know, I'm making me sad think about, you know, when we used to see everybody in person. Um, and so he was like, why aren't you selling your ink? Like, there's a market for it. And so uh, that's where we're, we're at. We incorporated a year ago. Um, we've got our ink out in beta with, I think, five or six different companies and seven or eight academic groups. And we're hoping to launch our online platform to sell. Um, all of our technology is now licensed from the university and all the, the things are in place. So we're hoping to sell um, our, our initial product called Tissue Print BioInk um, starting next month. And then we also have a second line of products. Uh, so for those of you who've seen Ruchi's paper where we've printed the miniature brains, which are releasing microspheres, uh, we're hoping to commercialize um, brain print. We've uh, got some funding to take that to market as well. So we're pretty, pretty excited about it. Um, and if you want to learn more, we're on, well, you're on our Instagram, so you can look, click to our website. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about BioInc because it's actually a very broad subject. Um, yeah. And then sometimes people go into biomaterials. I think they're kind of in interchangeable, except for ink is more of a suggestion as a fluid. Um, so what, I mean, I know you can't tell me exactly what goes into your ink because it's kind of a trade secret. But like, what are some of the typical concerns for a scientist in a lab doing bioprinting in terms of choosing bio ink? Yeah, well, so it's sort of interesting because if you look at what's commercially available, as I said, a lot of this is, is you know, they're pretty much most bio inks are usually either um, naturally derived or you do see a lot of like gelma based bio inks. Collagen's really popular. Ours is, yeah. ours is, is fibrin based, so it's the, the blood protein. Um, and so a lot of these inks were initially chosen because you could actually get them to print uh, with a printer. So either physically cross-linked, um, enzymatically, um, or through other um, elements like ions, or there's also uh, a lot of the Gelma ones are, are UV cross-linkable. So, you know, you have to have some way to, you know, turn your bio ink into a solid. Um, and so I think for a, a lot of the initial ink development, it was done based on what can we actually print and get the resolution we want, as opposed to um, actually getting tissue function. And, and this is something you actually see a lot um, even still with microfluidics where, you know, they'll put some neuronal cells on a chip and they'll grow them for three days and they'll be like, hey, neuron on a chip. But it's not really, <laughs> you know, that's not really long-term cell survival and things like that. Yeah. Um, the other thing is you see, and a lot of these inks were just used to print some of the easiest cells to, to print. So, you know, print some cancer cells, they're pretty <laughs> indifferent to, to their environment. But if you print things like stem cells, um, they're very sensitive. So that's where another reason we started the company is a lot of people who are printing stem cells would, would try to print stem cells, they would all die. And then they would ask us, you know, how do you get your cells to survive? And also, the other thing is, you know, if you actually want to take this out as a technology for drug screening, you have to have a functional output that you can measure. So, you know, with our Alzheimer's cells, you know, we look at the differentiation of the, the neurons, the, the length, and then you can also actually measure, you know, um, the amounts of tau and the amyloid beta in the media. So that's what you really want to see is, you know, are these neurons, you know, are they electrically functioning? Are they secreting the right factors and things like that? Um, because you, at the end of the day, you'll need an impact. And, output to measure if you're going to say, did this drug have an effect? Yeah, I think, you know, in, in 3D printing industry in general, we're very attracted to the structure part of 3D printing, because just visually it's very appealing. But I think now more and more so people will start to pay attention at the functional components of it. So I would imagine that for your ink or whatever future ink you make, that you have a set of metrics you're looking at, which you already talk a little bit about cell viability. Um, if they're secreting the kind, the right kind of chemicals or signals, um, genetic expression, I would imagine. Yep. Um, what else are you looking at in terms of like optimal outcome of a bio, yeah. bio ink? Yeah, yeah, I mean, like you also, there's all the physical properties like ureology um, and consistency, pore size for some of the hydrogel based bio inks. And um, as you mentioned, cell viability, cell um, expression profiling, um, it, it, when you commercialize things, you know, there's all the um, stability testing and making sure, you know, you're contamination free if you're shipping things out like that. So yeah. it, it's a pretty uh, standard panel of things. And there have been, um, I know Matt Kinsella's group over at McGill has done some really nice work towards um, coming up with these like parameters to quantify bio inks. 
because they do tend to be, um, in terms of mechanical properties, um, tend to be less stiff than things like plastics and sort of printability. And then there's the whole field of, you know, the, the shear thinning hydrogels that, you know, you used to print that then come back and take their shape. So um, I think there's still, you know, a bit of rigor to be added to the field. But as I mentioned, it's so highly interdisciplinary. It's been interesting to see, like, you know, that, like, you can put out really nice bioprinting papers and still have a thousand questions about the properties of the ink, um, yeah. the properties of the structure. Um, that's one thing that, uh, sorry, this one's going to go on a little tangent, but um, uh, like his, uh, Conrad from Aspect and I, uh, along with Simon from Aspect, we did a, a review paper on um, bioprinting brain tissue. And it blew my mind how many people just printed grids for neural tissue. And you're like, well, you'll, you don't really see a grid in the body, but if you do <laughs> print a grid, everyone knows you bioprinted it. So right. I think there's still a lot of work to be done just in terms of you know advancing these structures now that we have the technology um, to, to do what, you you know want to do just because it's it's so interdisciplinary so so um the ink that axolotl produces obviously is a consumable um is this available to all kinds of printing technology or is it only extrusion right now yeah it's it's um a chemis chemically cross-linked version so yeah you need to probably have an extrusion um we're hoping to to eventually look into some of the other other methods i know uh, jordan's really on us to look at you know finding <laughs> printable versions for the luminex too um yeah, so these are just, you know, this is some of the stuff we've been working on for a really long time. So we've got it pretty much ready to go. But it, it'll be really interesting to see, you know, where the field goes and where we can take the technology. So from your perspective, who are the dominant players, either people, labs, or uh, companies? Yeah, well, um, one of the companies who's been really exciting to watch them grow has been selling and sort of how they've transformed from uh, a bioing company into I think they're, they're taking over the world. Um, <laughs> yeah, kind of, yes. <laughs> yeah. Acquiring everybody, um, and they, they actually, uh, they just launched their um, clinical grade printer. I think it's the PDX. Uh, so that's pretty, like, it's been really interesting, uh, sort of the companies they've acquired and, and what they're doing with their technology. Um, obviously here uh, in Canada, i got to give a shout out to Aspect. Um, they're doing some really interesting things with getting uh, their um, technology used for actually making tissues you put into people. Um, Alevi. Volumetrics and Jordan Miller, um, great. I think we talked about Dimension Inks, which I, I think is really cool out of Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Fluid Form I think is doing some really cool things. Um, Regen Hugh, Regen Matt, 3D and Brenter. Like, there's actually I think it's always interesting to see the different you know technologies from the different companies, especially from Europe. Um, and then there's also been some really cool work out of Korea. But yeah, um, no, it's been. Oh, and um, I know that they they're more focused on things that are. Um, not necessarily health related, but um, uh, Carbon 3D and uh, Joe D. Simone's group, like just really cool technology. Um, although I know they've been more focused on making things like shoes recently than <laughs> Yeah, actually one major player, I think that started to show up in the news as 3D systems um, started to do all kinds of stuff was bioprinting. Um, and uh, also uh, desktop, desktop Meadow. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> just a quiet envision tech, which so okay. everybody is definitely looking into growing the 3D bioprinting space. So you're you're lucky, Stephanie. This is a great timing to start a company. Um, so we talk a little bit about future game changers, a little bit in the tech in the in the space. What do you think are going to be the future game changers for bioprinting? And maybe some of them are on your wish list of you you wish you you have you have that already. Yeah, um, one of the things that comes up a lot, especially if you're going to print tissues like uh, we do in our lab, is we need better ways of generating large numbers of cells because you just need a lot of cells to print humanized tissues. And even our organs have really high cell densities. So especially for stem cells, scale up of cell production um, will be key. Um, I think one thing we've talked about is like going to be the separation of, of clinical adoption of 3D printing versus the research adoption. Because uh, I really think that that's sort of two different markets. And I think you're really going to see at hospitals like clinical core facilities where um, doctors will just biopsy the patient, get them reprogrammed. And then, you know, the facility will do the, the printing and, and characterization and drug screening. Because I really think um, just given what, what Dr. Nygaard and I've seen and um, his IPSC lines from his patients with both Alzheimer's and dementia, like, I think a lot of these diseases are a lot more uh, heterogeneous than we thought. So I really think there's going to be a big trend towards personalized medicine. Um, the other thing will be um, that I'm pretty optimistic about um, is getting these into um, the pipeline for clinical drug development. So 
we all know that animal testing isn't great. Um, it's what we do because that's what we had. But now that we actually can generate human tissues from stem cells as opposed to having to rely on donations, um, I think that'll be really big is when we start getting these approved tissue models that you can use to at least start to lim not eliminate, but at least cut down on the number of um, animal testing and even being used in um, in combination, because I think you're get, you'll see a lot of different effects, which is why, you know, a lot of drugs fail when they go to clinic is because animals don't actually predict it. So I think you'll see yes. that that I think will be a big game changer, too. So, Well, just to give people a concept of what how many cells you're talking about, what I maybe like what how, how many cells in a, maybe one centimeter of tissue that you can bioprint? Yeah, so we, yeah, so we usually print between like one, one to five million cells per mil because we usually, we suspended in mills of bioink. Um, I know Adam's group, I think, is going up to like in the hundreds of millions. Um, and so, yeah, so you're, you're really looking at tons and tons of cells for those of you who haven't done cell culture. And usually it's all done essentially as manual labor by grad students. Um, so yeah, we really need some advances to, in um, bioreactor technology to get that going up. So. Yeah, that's a lot of cells. Um, I, I want to have a couple of shout outs and... Uh... One is from Shweta, uh, Snatty Scientist is her handle, it says great work, it would be interesting working. And we, I just interviewed her a couple weeks ago. She does bioprinting electronics wearables. Oh, nice. So that could be very interesting. Uh, she's looking into collaborating electrical stimulation on neural cells. Nice, yeah. That's yeah. definitely big. Uh, let's see. Well, there's some happiness and some on fire means. Mm -hmm. So anyways. <laughs> Well, uh, let's see. I think we addressed a lot of uh, topics today. Just want to make sure I'm not missing any topics here. Um, how How is COVID uh, in Canada? I mean, um, are you guys fully functional? Labs totally open? No, yeah, we're unlimited. And then we're, we're getting our third wave now. So it's, uh, oh. yeah, so um, the numbers, like, I think, yeah, let's just keep going up by the day because we just had spring break and then the, the testing lags two weeks. Um, but yeah, we're under, we're under COVID protocol so it's you know social distance in lab four people in lab at a time but we've still been managing to be somewhat productive despite limitations also not helped by um and, and shout out to anybody from my lab watching um <laughs> not help not helped by the fact or maybe helped by the fact that there's nowhere fun to go since travel's not really allowed <laughs> so i feel like a bad boss when i try to be like well maybe you should go and i'm like oh yeah maybe you should study it. yeah well, they, they, that's why they're, they're at work, because they're like, well, what else is there to do if, you know, restaurants are closed and everything's closed, so. Yeah, but I'm sure it's going to pass. And our time is up. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, Stephanie, do you have any final shout outs to names? Feel free uh, yeah. to say that right now. I don't know. <laughs> Who else here? But thanks, everybody, for coming. And, and definitely check out um, my lab, the Willard Lab. Um, and Axolotl, and yeah, um, and thanks, Jenny. Yeah, and 3D Heels has been great, and you know, uh, I remember we had lots of great 3D Heels events before. <laughs> yes, before. thank you very much for always engaging with us, um, and uh, I will include all the links of your labs, of your publications, and uh, even give a shout out of the postdoc that you're uh, <laughs> trying to promote <laughs> on our website and also social media. Thank you very much, Stephanie. All right. And bye, everybody. That's it for this episode. Bye, Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at 3D Heels, and check out the links in the show notes. See you next time.